Amen. Take your Bible, if you will, and turn with me to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7, and then we're going to look over at Isaiah chapter 9, and then uh, we'll be sharing a great deal more scripture with you this morning than usual, um, but we won't be turning to all of it just for the sake of time. I do want to say as our, as our young people make their exit that this morning's message is going to be a little bit different for us. Most of the time we take a passage of Scripture and, and work through that passage. We aren't going to do it that way this morning. We're going to look at a, a couple of different verses. And uh, again, I'm going to share with you many other verses. But I want you to understand it is December. And in December, we celebrate the coming of the Lord into this world. Now, He came to save sinners. There's no question about that. He said so. But I want you to think about this morning who it is whose coming we celebrate. Now, let me, let me share this thought with you. This is a few years ago. I was talking to a young man, an, an educated young man, and he said this to me. And I've heard other people say similar things, but he said, if this God of yours is real, why doesn't he come to the earth and show himself? And I looked at the young man and I said, well, he did. And he thought a minute. And he, then he said, you're talking about Jesus. I said, yes, I am. I'm going to tell you this morning, he did come. God came. I'm going to show you that in, in the little bit of scripture that we're looking at. That that is who came to this world. God did come to this earth. I'm going to tell you something else. He's coming again. He's coming again. With that said, by now hopefully you found Isaiah chapter 7. And uh, I just want to give you a little background as to what's going on in this chapter. If you've been paying attention to the news at all, you know that the nation of Israel is at war. Uh, they were attacked back in October in a surprise attack, very brutal attack. And they've been fighting as a result of that ever since. Uh, just heard yesterday that there was a ceasefire that had been um, declared and, and it was had a time limit on it. But the uh, the other side not the Israelis, but the other side decided to end that ceasefire without notice and uh, start fighting again. So they are fighting again. Now that is between Israel and the people who live in a, a strip of land called Gaza. And uh, that is what is considered today to be Palestine. Give you a little history. Palestine is a word that uh, comes from Latin, but it is the Latin way from when the Romans ruled that area thousands of years ago of saying Philistine or Philistia. So it is, if you read your Bible, there were often wars between Israel and the Philistines. These are not the same people, obviously, but it's the same kind of thing that's going on today. Other countries have gotten involved. And uh, in Isaiah chapter 7, the reason I'm telling you all this it was going on then. Uh, it wasn't the Philistines in this case. It was the Assyrians. Uh, think of the country of Syria today. Uh, it, in, the Assyrian Empire encompassed the country of Syria, but it went far north of that. So it was much larger than the present company of Syria, uh, country of Syria, I meant to say. And then uh, this may be, if you don't know your Bible real well, if you've read your Bible, but you don't know a great deal about it. This may be hard to understand, but this was uh, Jerusalem was in the territory of Judah. We talked about that some last Sunday. Uh, but Jerusalem in the territory of Judah, but the nation had divided north and south. So the southern part came to be called Judah. The northern part came to be called Israel. It used, prior to that, it was all Israel. So Israel has teamed up with Assyria and they've attacked Judah, and they've surrounded Jerusalem. That's what's going on in Isaiah chapter 7. Now, the king of Judah goes to Isaiah the prophet and asks him to pray the Lord, and the Lord gave an answer. 
And in his answer, the Lord says, and this is in the, the beginning part of the chapter up through verse 9, uh, the Lord said that not for the king of Judah not to worry, he was going to rescue Jerusalem, he was going to rescue the people of Judah, and they would not fall to their enemies. The Lord would take care of them. Let's pick up the reading then at verse 10, which says, Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, that's the king of Judah, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. Now, I want you to, to notice what's happening here. The Lord God, speaking to King Ahaz, and says, Ask me for a sign. Ask me for anything. Ask me for a sign. A lot of people want to see a sign from God. A lot of people like a cartoon that I, I have in one of the books that I have. Uh, there's a cartoon in it. And uh, this fellow in the cartoon is looking up the sky and says, God, if you're up there, give me a sign. And this great big huge billboard falls down out of the sky and says, I'm up here. And that's the kind of thing people want to see. You, you know, can I share something with you? That's probably not going to happen that way. But God did something greater than that. Much greater. Verse 12, but Ahaz said, I will not ask. Neither will I tempt the Lord. Do you understand that? God said, ask me for a sign. Ask me to do anything. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll show you that I'm going to do what I promised to do, and I will do it. Ask me for any sign. I'll do it. And the king says, I will not. I won't ask. You know what James said about that in his epistle? He said, you have not because you ask not. A lot of things you don't get from God because you don't ask. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. Neither will I tempt the Lord. Now, he might be tempting the Lord if he was doing something wrong, but he wouldn't have been doing anything wrong to ask. He would have been doing what God told him. So in verse 13, and he said, this is Isaiah giving what the Lord said. And he said, hear ye now, O house of David, come tonight. We're going to talk more about the house of David. Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my God also? Therefore, and we've been working all this time to get to verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. I want you to pay attention to that last word there. That last word is a name. It is the name Emmanuel. Now, I'm not going to ask you to turn there, but I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 1 and verses 21 to 23. And listen carefully. This is Matthew writing more than 700 years after Isaiah wrote. And he says this, And she, referring to Mary, she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. What's his name? Jesus. We're going to say more about that. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He shall save his people from their sins. That's why his name is Jesus. What is, why does his name have to be Jesus for him to save his people from their sins? Because the name Jesus means Jehovah God is the Savior. Or Jehovah is my Savior. That's what the name means. She shall bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, the prophet in this case Isaiah, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. I shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Isn't that what we just read in Isaiah? Yes. Here, uh, Matthew is quoting from Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. But I didn't finish the verse in Matthew. Let me start it again. You look at Isaiah 7, 14 and listen to Matthew chapter 2 and verse, I'm sorry, chapter 1 and verse 23. 
Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. God came into this world. Now, if you're in Isaiah chapter 7, turn over to chapter 9. The promise continues in chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the one that the virgin would conceive and bear a son whose name is Emmanuel. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. He is going to be a king. The government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name, notice name, not names, one name, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. Who is this person? Who is this child that's born? He is wonderful. He is a counselor. You, you can come to him for counsel at any time, but he is the mighty God. And in case you wonder, which God are you talking about? Well, he tells you the mighty God, the everlasting father. There's only one everlasting father. And the prince of peace. If you've been with us uh, in our studies recently, that is Shiloh, the prince of peace. Verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this, will perform this. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Speak to us through it now, we pray. Give us an understanding. Guide us into all truth by your spirit. And Lord, I pray that each person here would have their spiritual needs met in this hour. And again, if anyone's here who doesn't know you as Savior, may they come to trust you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. All year, we say that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And we should say that. We also say that you need to believe in his name. This also is right. Acts 16, 31 uh, and verse 30 the jailer in the city of Philippi uh, talked to Paul and Silas who were in jail. They were in jail, yeah, a bunch of criminals. Well, I guess you could say that. What was their crime? They'd been preaching the gospel, telling people to believe in Jesus and be saved. That's what they went to jail for? Yeah, a lot of people have gone to jail for that. But the jailer said to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Acts 16, verse 30, verse 31 says, And they said, Paul and Silas said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. What do you need to do to be saved? Greatest question ever asked. Greatest answer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 to 13, talks about believing in the name of Jesus. And it's not the only place it talks about that. 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 to 13 says, And this is the record, like a title to a car or the deed to a house. This is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. These things, listen, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Stop right there. According to what we've read from the Bible this morning and what I've read to you, what is the name of the Son of God? The, if, only a few people know that, I guess. What is the name of the Son of God? Oh, thank you. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know, not guess, think, hope so, maybe so. You may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So, it is important that we understand the name of the Son of God. And we, it's important that we understand that. We are to believe in Jesus. We are to believe in His name. Then we are to honor His name. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, and Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 11, both tell us, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. 
We do that all the time. Oh, I know what you're talking about, preacher, people who curse and swear. I, I told this story here before, but I think it's a good time to tell it again. Besides, I want to hear it. Years ago, uh, we bought a device, and, and I don't know that you can even buy such a device anymore. I haven't seen one in many years. But we bought a device called Curse Free TV, and you could hook it to your television set, and if you were watching something and people were uh, cursing on there, it would, it would blank it out, and you wouldn't hear it. Okay? How many of you knew about a device like that? Yeah, I'm not kidding you. We, we had one. And so you put it on there, and, and you didn't have to hear the bad language. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name a TV show, and you may know of the show. You may not. You may have liked it. You may not have, but I'm just going to tell you what happened. I was watching an episode of the TV show Walker, Texas Ranger. Now, whether you know that or not, it's beside the point. In this episode, the ranger was taking a man to prison. He had been arrested, charged with a crime. He was taking him to prison. And the ranger asked the prisoner, he said, how did you get mixed up with this gang that you were with when the crime was committed? And the man looked at the ranger and said, well, ranger, I used to be a really bad man, but that was before I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. He didn't say that on network television. He did. I almost fell off the couch. But here's the reason I'm telling you that story. When he said, I used to be a really bad man, but that was before I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, Curse Free TV took out the words Jesus Christ. Why? Because it thought that that was swearing, that that was profanity. What does that tell you about our society? It tells you a lot about it, doesn't it? If you say Jesus Christ, you're swearing? Well, a lot of people are, aren't they? But that's what the Lord says when He says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The Lord will not hold him guiltless to take of His name in vain. So should we honor the name of the Lord? We should. We should. Now, that's not all that that verse means. It also means don't use the Lord's name lightly. Don't misuse the Lord's name. Throughout Scripture, the name of the Lord is given to us in many different ways, and I'm going to spend the next few minutes telling you about many of those ways. I don't think I'll get all of them. But let's begin in Genesis 1.1. You don't need to turn there. We're going to go too fast. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God, in Genesis 1.1, is the Hebrew word El. Just, it's spelled just like it sounds. E-L. El. Now, there's a suffix on the name there, and it's Ohim, El Ohim. Now, El means God, and the Ohim and the Im ending makes it say God who is one but many. I thought there was only one God. You thought right. You weren't wrong. So what does it mean? God who is one but many. Well, later on in that same chapter, God says, let us, plural personal pronoun, let us make man in our image, another plural personal pronoun. Huh. So God said, let us make man in our image. Well, in whose image is God creating man? Later on, we read, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them Male and female, created, created he him. Male and female, created he them. Only one God. So why did he use plural personal pronouns? He's talking about what we call the Trinity. Well, preacher, I want to tell you something. I've read the Bible and you can't find the word Trinity in, in your Bible. You're right. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. It isn't. There's another word that you'll find in the Bible that means what we mean when we say Trinity. It's the word Godhead. You'll find that word in the Bible. So, there are not three gods. There's one God. God who exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, Preacher, can you explain the Trinity to me? 
No, I can't. I can give you some ideas. I can help you relate to it in some ways, but I can't fully explain it to you. I can tell you this. God lives in eternity. You and I live in time. Time had a beginning. Eventually, time will have an end. And in time, everything in time has a beginning and an end. God lives outside of time in a realm we call eternity where things do not have to have a beginning and an end. They are constant. I'm telling you that to tell you this. You and I can only be in one place at one time because we are limited by time and space. God is not limited by time and space. So God can be manifest in different ways, but only one God. Hey, well, I'm not sure that helped much. Let me try something else. You are a human being. And as a human being, you are physical. That's the part you can touch right here. You are mental. That's the part that when you hear those words in your head, that's where they come from. They come from your mind. You are physical, you are mental, and you are spiritual. You have a spirit. That's what it means when it says God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. It means we are created in the spiritual image of God. Hey, why are we in the physical image of God? Well, in a sense, because if you read through your Bible, you'll find that God has eyes and ears and a nose and a mouth. And he has hands and he has feet. And we have all of that. But what makes us Really, the image of God is that we have a spirit. In John chapter 4, Jesus said God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we are a spirit. I like what C.S. Lewis said years ago. He said, you do not have a soul. Now you got to hear the whole statement. He said, you do not have a soul. You are a soul. Think about that. He says, you do not have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. One day this body is going to be gone. Dust returns to the earth which gave it. Man made from dust returns to the earth from whence it came. But the spirit goes on. That's the real you. So it is that sense that we are created in the image of God. Now, Elohim, a uniplural noun, means the strong one. There are many other Eloistic combinations they are called, where God, the root word God, El, has suffix which give us a further meaning. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Elohim, uniplural noun, meaning the strong one. El Elyon is another which means the most high God. Of all the gods or things that people call gods in the world, he is the most high God. He is the father of all. Not saying that there actually are other gods. Saying people say there are other gods. Well, how many other gods do people say? A last count I heard was in the millions. Al Shaddai. Al Shaddai, the almighty God. El Olam, the everlasting God. And then he's called Adonai. If a synagogue met yesterday, as many of them did, they generally start the services with what they call the Shema. And it sounds like this. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Adonai. Adonai is another name for the Lord, and it means Lord. I was watching television again just recently. And uh, I, I was surprised by something. There was a character on the television speaking Greek. And I actually understood what he said. And I said, wow, I'm so happy that I understood that. <laughs> I'm not a great Greek scholar, but I got what he said. I understood what he was saying. You know what he was saying? He was, in essence, saying, Lord. He said, Kurios. Kurios is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Adonai. It means Lord. And then there's Jehovah or Yahweh, as some like to pronounce it. And we could talk about the difference in the pronunciation, but that's not our point right now. And that always, 
always without exception is the redemptive name of God. And Isaiah 43 says, I, even I am the Lord, Yahweh or Jehovah, beside me there is no Savior. Now stop and think about that. If Jehovah is the only Savior, and you go to the New Testament, it tells us there's none other name other than the name Jesus. There's none other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. And it tells us there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus is the only Savior. So if in Isaiah 43, God says, I, even I, am the Lord, meaning Jehovah, beside me there is no Savior. And if the New Testament tells us Jesus is the only Savior, who does that make Jesus? It does, doesn't it? And you know who that makes Jesus? Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. He came. He came to be here. Jehovah, Yahweh, means the self-existent one. He is the I Am. Again, in Genesis 2-7, it was the Lord God who formed man and gave him life. In Genesis 2, 16 and 17, it is the Lord who first gives who gives the first commandment not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In Genesis 3, 14 and 15, it is the Lord God who promised the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. We talked about that last time. In Genesis 3, 21, it is the Lord God or Jehovah Elohim who made coats of skins for Adam and Eve to cover them after their sin. An animal was sacrificed. And they were given a covering or an atonement. In Exodus 3.15, Moses is told that Jehovah Elohim is my name forever. Then there's and Jehovah Elohim, Lord God. Then there's Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. Jehovah Rapha, which means the Lord who heals. Jehovah Nisi, who the Lord our banner, whose name is in whose name we do battle. Like a flag to go forth in the battle, the Lord our banner. Then there's Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. Jehovah Ra'a, the Lord our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Jehovah Sidnecu, Sidkenu. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Shama, the Lord who is always present. We talk about the ever presence of God. You read through the Psalms and David says, that if I ascend up into heaven, behold thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. Whither shall I go from thy presence? You can't. Jonah tried to run away from the presence of the Lord. It didn't work. You can't do it. Genesis 49.10, we're told that a descendant of Judah, a lawgiver, will come who is Shiloh, or the Prince of Peace. Jesus said, come unto me, and I will give you rest. In Psalm 2, he is the Lord's anointed. In Psalm 2, 7 and 2, 12, he is the Lord's son. He is the only begotten son of God. And it's, he is the one in whom all who trust will be blessed. And then that brings us back to where we started here in Isaiah 7, 14, where he says his name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then in Isaiah 9, 6, he is the child, the son who is given unto us and who shall govern as a king. His name is wonderful, and it is. His name is Counselor. You can said a while ago, you can go to him for counsel at any time. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father, and he is the Prince of Peace. In Daniel 9.25, he is Messiah, meaning the Christ. By the way, back in Psalm 2, when it says, calls him the Lord's anointed, that's the same word. He's the Messiah. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, and James chapter 2, verse 1, he is the Lord of glory. In Revelation 19, 16, he is King of kings and Lord of lords. In Hebrews, he is prophet, priest, and king. In Revelation 1, 8, and verse 11, Revelation 21, 16, and Revelation 22, 13, he is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The only way he can be the beginning and the end is to be everything and to be eternal. Then we read to you earlier in Matthew 121, where his name is Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. 
Paul writes in 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. Why did he come? To save sinners. Paul says, I'm the chiefest of sinners. He believed he was. He believed he was the worst sinner that ever lived. I think some of us could give him some competition, but uh, that, that's what he said. You remember, maybe you remember, maybe you don't, maybe this didn't happen to you, but many of you, I think it probably did. When you were young, you went to Sunday school, and they taught you to sing a song. And the song went like this. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in that tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house to stay. How many of you remember that? Okay, I know what you're thinking. Well, I've heard better versions. That's okay. That's not the point. The point is that you get the story in mind. Now, that story is in Luke chapter 19. And after that story, right after that story, in verse 10 of Luke chapter 19, Jesus says, For the Son of Man, talking about himself, is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why he came. God came into this world to save lost mankind. That's what we're celebrating at Christmas time. That's it. I've mentioned this a few times uh, for a period of 12 years. I would teach a class in uh, some of the, the aftercare program, not during the school day, but in the aftercare program, several of the elementary schools around here. And I was not allowed to preach the word there. Uh, but I would teach. And then at the end of every class, I'd sit everybody down and um, tell them a story. And most of the students, that was their favorite time of the class, was story time. So I'd tell them a story. I told them different stories. I told them about Isaac Newton. I told them about uh, different great American heroes, such as Alvin York and other people. And... Uh, when we get around holidays, I'd tell them the stories of holidays. I'd tell them the story of Hanukkah. I would tell them the story of other holidays. And uh, one occasion, I told the story of Christmas. I said, this is what Christmas is about and how we, why we have Christmas. And one little boy said, Christmas is about Jesus? He was so surprised. He had never heard that before. He had no idea. I'm going to tell you, most of the world has no idea. They, they literally do not have any idea. They think it's about Santa Claus. They think Christmas is about the reindeer. Now, if you want to have reindeer, that's fine, but that's not what it's about. They think it's about giving presents. I, I like the idea of giving presents. I like to give presents, and I don't mind getting them either. But the truth of the matter is, it's not what it's about. It's about the greatest gift in all the world. And the greatest gift is when God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Revelation 118, Jesus said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. He is the resurrected one. He's the one who was dead but is now alive. And he has conquered death. And if you come to him and put your faith and trust in him, he'll forgive your sins and he'll give you everlasting life. He's promised to do that. Again, the name Jesus means Jehovah is Savior. I've surprised people with some other things. And, and to be fair, some of these things were surprising to me when I first found them out. I was talking to a lady who had recently had a son and this is not recently, this boy's a grown man now. But she named her son Joshua. And I told her, you know, that's the same as the name Jesus. <gasps> it is? She had no idea. It is. It's the same name. You see, Joshua is how you would say it in bringing it from Hebrew into English. Jesus is how you say it, bringing it from Greek into English. It's the same name. Joshua, 
uh, is the name Yeshua, Hosea. These are all variations of the same name. I'd spent a year, a long time ago, back in uh, about 1983 or four, somewhere back there. I spent a long time for my daily devotions looking up every variation of Jesus' name in the Bible. It, it took me a year to do it. Made notes on every variation that's there. You'd be amazed how many there are. His name is throughout the Bible. Matthew chapter 12, 21 says, And in his name, in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Who are the Gentiles? That's all of us who are not, not of the nation of Israel. If you're of the nation of Israel, you're not a Gentile. If you're not of the nation of Israel, you're one of the Gentiles. That's, that's me. I'm one of them. Matthew eighteen twenty nine, Jesus said, where, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. John 16, 24, he said, Hitherto, up until now, hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. Do what? Pray in his name. When I pray, I pray in Jesus' name. Why? Because he said to. I've gone places, been asked to pray, and they've asked me, and could you possibly pray and not mention Jesus? Now, I've not ever done this. I haven't. I've been tempted to do it. I've done other things, but I haven't done this. I've been tempted to say to that person, so you would like me to pray, yes, but you don't want me to mention Jesus, no. Okay, so what would you like me to do? Would you like me to just stand up when it's time and say, may the force be with you? Because if I'm not praying to Jesus, to whom am I praying? Some unknown entity? Some force? No. Jesus said, Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joys may be full. Acts chapter 3, verses 13 to 16 tells us there's healing in Jesus' name, and there is. In Acts chapter 4, verses 10 to 12, Christ the Anointed One, the Sent One, the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, in verse 12 is where it said, I quoted it a while ago, There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no other name through which you may be saved. But in that same passage, Acts chapter 4 and verse 18, the apostles were forbidden to speak or to teach in the name of Jesus. Can I ask you a question? Why is that a problem? Do you know in society, and, and, and it would have been this way back in the New Testament times as well, if you want to talk to people about Jupiter, you could. Nobody would get upset with you. And today, if you want to talk about Jupiter, everybody's fine with that, no problem. If you want to talk about Krishna, everybody's happy with that. If you want to talk about Vishnu, everybody's happy with that. No problem, that's your right, it's your freedom, do it. And I'm not saying it's not your right. If you want to talk about Allah, well, go ahead. If you want to talk about, uh, again, Zeus, go ahead. So why is it a problem when you want to talk about Jesus? You want to talk about Buddha? Nobody has a problem with that. Matter of fact, they may think you're more educated. So why is it a problem to talk about Jesus? Why is Jesus' name the problem? I'm going to tell you why. Because Jesus is the one true God. That's why. All of those others are no gods at all. None. You see, there's no opposition to the gods. There's opposition to God. Acts chapter 5, verse 40. They were forbidden again, and they were rejoicing to be counted worthy to suffer for his name. And they ceased not to preach in his name. On one occasion, I was, I was at a large banquet. I won't go into detail on it. And I met a, a very famous individual. If I mentioned his name, many of you would not uh, recognize it. But I, I think I'll mention it. His name was Edgar Mitchell. Raise your hand if you know who that is. Yeah, I didn't think so. Uh, raise your hand if you know who Buzz Aldrin was. Okay. Who's Buzz Aldrin? Oh, okay. Master not best known for what? 
Okay, who was the first man on the moon? Okay, Neil Armstrong. Good, very good. Edgar Mitchell, whose name you don't know, was the sixth man to walk on the moon. Okay. <laughs> nobody remembers the sixth guy you remember the first guy and the second guy nobody remembers the sixth guy you know what he used to live right down here in Boca Raton yeah so he lived right here your neighbor and you didn't know it I met him at this banquet and at the banquet I was asked by an official to have prayer but we we don't want you mentioning Jesus now I thought about it thought what am I going to do I'll tell you what I did you may not agree with it. It may not be what you do. Here's what I did. I never, underscore the word never, read prayers. I just pray when asked to pray. I just pray it as talk to the Lord. So on this occasion, I decided to read a prayer. I took a book up with me, and when it was time to pray, I read the prayer word for word, and the prayer closed in Jesus' name. And that official who had asked me not to mention Jesus, he, he wasn't happy about that. And he came to me after the function. And, he, and by the way, it wasn't Edgar Mitchell. He said this, just to make that clear. But this official came to me and said, I thought I talked to you about that. I said, yes, sir, you did. He said, what were you doing? I said, I was reading the prayer of George Washington. He said, oh, well, you might have said that. Didn't think I had to. Folks, what I'm telling you is it is not wrong to pray in Jesus' name. It is right to pray in Jesus' name. His is the name that is above every name. As a matter of fact, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 21, it says his name is above every name. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it says at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That day is coming. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, His name is more excellent than the names of the angels. What are you saying, preacher? Here's what I'm saying. The name of the Lord is holy. The name of the Lord is holy. We ought not to take it in vain. The name of the Lord is the name of our Savior. I was out washing a car in front of the house one day and two ladies came down the street and they stopped and they wanted to talk and that was fine. And um, they said to me, says, we believe that God has a personal name and that he wants us to call him by that name. I said, well, that's good. I, I believe that also. She, they said, you do? I said, yes, I believe his name is Jesus. And they said, you don't believe that, do you? I said, yes, ma'am, I certainly do. Now, if you'll wait here a minute, let me go in the house, get my Bible. I'd be glad to tell you about it. And they, they didn't want to do that. I'm not making fun of those ladies. I'm telling you how this world does not understand who it is that came at Christmas time. They do not understand that he is God with us. That God came into this world. The creator and king of the universe was here. I want to read to you one more passage and we'll be finished this morning. I'm reading out of 1 John. And I want you to listen carefully to what it says. 1 John chapter 1. In 1 John chapter 1, um, John is writing, obviously. And I want you to listen to what he had to say. And, and as you listen to what John has to say, think about who John is. In the Gospels, you read about Jesus and his 12 disciples. But there are three names that you read more often than all the other disciples. There's some of the disciples only mentioned a couple of times. But there are three names you see again and again and again. They are Peter, James, and John. John was with him. And here's what John has to say about Jesus. He says about Jesus in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1, that which was from the beginning. What beginning? In the beginning when God created the heaven and the earth, that beginning. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard. We heard him. Which we have seen with our eyes. We saw him. 
which we have looked upon, we watched him, and our hands have handled of the word of life. We touched him. With all of our senses, we heard him, we saw him, we touched him, we watched him, we observed him. He was here. He was here. For the life was made, was manifested. Manifest in the Bible means made visible. Life was made visible. The life was manifested and we have seen it. We have seen life. And bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested, made visible unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. That you may also, also may have fellowship with us. Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. John says he was here. We saw him. We heard him. We touched him. He was here. Who was? Emmanuel. God with us. When we read through the Bible, it helps us to understand the meaning of these different names of Jesus. But my whole point today is to get you to understand who came at Christmas time. Who's, what are we really celebrating? We are celebrating the fact that God came into this world. We're celebrating the fact that God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, anybody who believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I know some of you think you already said that. I'm going to say it again. Whosoever believes in him should not perish. You won't die, but you'll have everlasting life. Therefore, we are to believe in his name. <clears throat> we are to pray in his name. We are to trust in his name. We are to teach in his name. We are to preach in his name. We are to hope in his name. And if I can't do anything else today, I want to give you hope. I want to give you hope based on the fact that the God, the creator, was here because he loves you. And he is coming again. Jesus said in John chapter 14, I will come again. That's a pretty clear statement. I will come again. So we should do all to the glory of his name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for this time we've had together this morning. Lord, it is my prayer that as we come to you, we will focus upon your name, but moreover, we'll focus on the fact that you are Emmanuel. You are God with us. God who came to live with man. God who endured the things that men endure. God who suffered and paid the penalty for all the sin of all mankind for all time at the cross. Who was buried and rose again the third day as Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, by which also you are saved. For I delivered unto you, first of all, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Same writer. Right, wrote in Romans 10, 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father, help us. Help us to focus upon Jesus. Help us to tell others about Jesus. Help us to make Jesus the center of it all. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We'll finish our prayer in just a moment. Before we do, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Head bows. Eyes closed, nobody looking around. Don't be concerned about what others are doing. Just consider your own relationship with God. Has there been a time and a place in your life that you can remember, does not need to have been here, does not have to have been in a church, but is there a time and a place in your life that you can remember where you understood that you, like all the rest of us, 
of sin, that is, you violated the will and the word of God. And you understand that that makes you, like all the rest of us, a sinner. And the sinners are separated from God forever. But that God loves you. And he sent his only begotten son into this world in the form of a human being to pay for the sins that I have done, that you have done, and that the whole world has committed. He paid for them at the cross. You understood that. You understood that he rose from the grave and that he's alive today. And you trusted him to forgive your sins and save you and give you everlasting life. Have you ever come to that point? If you have... You ought to praise God. And I praise God for you. But if you're not 100% sure of that, if you're not 100% sure that you've trusted in the ever-living one, you've trusted in the sinless Son of God who loves you and gave himself for you, I invite you to do that right now. Open your heart and call on him. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you are Emmanuel. I believe that you paid for our sins at the cross. I believe you paid for my sins at the cross. I believe that you rose again, and I'm trusting you right now, right here, to forgive me, to save me, to give me everlasting life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, maybe you follow me in that prayer. Maybe you didn't. But you can still call upon the name of the Lord. If you need help with that, say, Preacher, sounds good to me. I don't understand it. We're going to sing a hymn. I'm going to leave the platform. You come down and meet me there. We'll have somebody take a Bible and show you what it means to be saved. We're not asking you to join anything or sign anything. We just want you to know how you can be saved. Christian friend, celebrate anew the coming of our God into this world. And understand how much he loves you. And he didn't just love you thousands of years ago. He loves you today. And whatever problem you're struggling with, whatever you're going through, he's there with you. Lord, bless now. As we sing this hymn of invitation, if there are people who have a spiritual need and they need help, they need prayer, they need help, they need counsel, they have a question, Lord, this is their time to come. Their decision they need to make, this is the time to make it. Father, bless and move in this invitation time. We do pray in Jesus' name. Amen.